I must tell you once again, it always seems cold. We only just learned to build fireplaces that send most of the smoke up and outside instead of through the halls. It's the mark of a noble house to have fine woven tapestries hanging on our walls in our rooms. It's true they add color and that's noble, but when they're hung over the window openings, the tapestries keep out the cold as well. A queen of England is said to have laid tapestries on the floor to walk on, <laughs> but people throughout the kingdom laughed at her for such extravagance. For defense, castles are built with few windows, so it always seems dark in here. It's hard to see with this poor light, and that dictates our day. Activities begin at sun up, and all but end at sundown. Sheesh, what a drag. Didn't these people have any fun? Well, of course they did, but it was a different kind of fun than we're used to. Let's get straight to the point and find out what nobles did for fun. At home, nobles could entertain themselves by playing games. Chess and backgammon were around in those days, and so were early forms of croquet and bowling. Some nobles paid jesters and troubadours to entertain guests at dinner, just like having their own personal comedian and singer on staff. Sometimes traveling performers would pass through to put on a show. Hunting was also a favorite pastime. A small army of dogs and servants would go into the woods to scare up deer or wild boar. When the animal was cornered, the noble would kill it with a sword or spear. <coughs> Nobles also loved hunting with falcons. The birds were carefully trained and became prized possessions. The noble would carry the bird on his wrist and keep it close by him at dinner. And if someone tried to steal a falcon, the punishment was to let the bird take a few bites out of his skin. Go on, boy, get him. Nobles really knew how to eat, too. The big meal of the day was at midday. They called it dinner. Here, read a menu for one medieval feast. First course, meat in pepper sauce, boar's head and tusks, swans, a fat capon. A capon is an overgrown chicken, the closest thing they had to turkey. Pheasants, heron, sturgeon. A fish. OK, read on. That's just the first course. You're kidding. Second course, venison, that's deer meat, right? Jelly, stuffed pig, peacocks, cranes, great tarts, fried meat. What? There's a third course? Partridge, pigeons, quails, rabbits, glazed eggs, and eagle. And that is only part of what was on the menu. So do these people eat like pigs or what? No, the point at a medieval feast wasn't to pig out. People just chose small samples from every course. The richest noble was the one who could offer the most goodies to choose from. It was a way to show off his power. And there's another important way to show off power in the kitchen. Just imagine, you're a modern day cook roasting a chicken and you whip up a little something like this. Mix in some parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme, oh, then some raisins, how about some sugar, salt, pepper, vinegar, oh yes, and a few quarts of wine. All together? Ew. Well, that's how medieval cookbooks do it. All kinds of spices mixed together for cooking all kinds of food. How come? Well, it's hard to keep things fresh, so the spices help make tough, tasteless food go down a little easier. Plus, a marinade of spices help preserve food before refrigerators hit the market hundreds of years later. And using spices was a tasty sign of power for another reason. In the Middle Ages, most spices came from countries far away from Europe, and they were incredibly expensive. One ounce of black pepper could cost as much as a laborer could earn in a week. So if the guests tasted a lot of spices in the noble's food at dinner, they knew he was really a big shot if he could afford them. Speaking of big shots, could we get our noble guy in here to give us a little lesson on table manners? First of all, it's very important to wash the hands. Everyone at the table shares dishes of food, so hands and fingernails must be clean. 
And during dinner, we use finger bowls. Our plate is a piece of bread we call a trencher. It soaks up all the juice and gravy and can be used later, perhaps to feed the dogs or the poor. Everyone sits down to the table with their own knife, not a dagger, a knife for eating. We share dishes and our drinking cup with the person next to us. Ale is most often in the cup. Only a fool would drink water from any nearby stream because it isn't clean for drinking. The meat is carved and the food is served by young pages and squires being trained here at the castle. It's important that they do everything in just the proper way. After all, a young man's success depends on how good his table manners are. The noble, take two. For the noble of the Middle Ages, the tournament is a place to practice the arts of war that he must be ready to use in the service of his king. No, not really. Nobles liked watching knights in shining armor competing for power in ceremonial shows called tournaments. Knights follow the rules, or the code of chivalry, when competing on horseback with their lances. Nobles themselves would frequently even compete in these tournaments, but once you get past the early Middle Ages, nobles were not really the king's warriors any longer. Remember when a knight became a lord, he started turning into more of a business manager and less of a fighter? So, when the king held court, it all looked very regal and splendid, but it was much more like a bunch of business advisors meeting with the chairman of the board, giving him advice and elbowing each other, trying to wrangle promotions for better positions. Better positions? Well, royal government positions that could bring a noble more money and more power. It wasn't unusual for a noble in the Middle Ages to build up more power than the king, and then to rebel any time the king did something the noble didn't like. <laughs> it was no picnic being a king in those days, let me tell you. No picnic being a noble either. So, what was the noble's wife doing while all this was going on? Let's get the lowdown on the ladies. Like me, noble women in the Middle Ages don't have many legal rights. We are under the control of a father or guardian, and then if we marry, we are under the control of our husbands. But we don't just sit around doing needlepoint. A noble's wife is, in a lot of ways, his business partner. When my husband is forced to travel, I, as the noble lady, take charge of running the estate. Even when the lords are at home, there is far too much work for one person to manage. So noble ladies take an active part in managing accounts, supervising servants, and entertaining important visitors, including the king. In some cases, if a lady's husband dies or ends up in prison, noble ladies take charge of running local government, even sometimes leading soldiers through war and sieges. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, noble women show we know our business just as well as noble men do.